welcome everyone to join our webinar today. Uh, my name is Chao Sheng, and uh, I'm the global product manager for the regenerative medicine manufacturing portfolio at the Mutiny Biotech. And uh, today, uh, we are very honored to have Professor Christelle Mungville from France here with us to talk about her projects using human proponent stem cells for clinical applications. So today, uh, I will first very quickly introduce the established workflows at Mutiny Biotech for automated and closed manufacturing of human prepotent stem cells and their derivatives. And then I will hand over to Professor Christelle Mongville, and she will introduce their exciting projects on developing a novel tissue engineered product consisting of RPE cells derived from clinical grade human embryonic stem cells and their ongoing effort in developing protocols to upscale the production of RPE cells using automated and GMP compliant solutions. For example, the CleanMac Prodigy platform. So first, I want to uh, give you a quick overview of the Mutiny Biotech product portfolio. Well, as shown in this slide, so we offer a wide range of applications and uh, workflows you know, to support customer applications from benchtop to bedside, including sample preparation, cell isolation, cell activation and culture, cell analysis, and imaging, et cetera. Yeah. And many of these technologies can also be used for regenerative medicine applications. For example, manufacturing of human prepotent stem cells and their derivatives. Well, speaking of uh, manufacturing of human PCs and uh, their derivatives, we all know that these are very challenging and very complex endeavors. And most of the current manufacturing processes involve multiple expensive instruments, very skilled operators, and high-class clean rooms. And many, many uh, separated open handling steps are also introduced into these workflows. Meanwhile, standardized in-process control and the quality control assays are required throughout the entire processes. In addition, in certain applications, the desired cell populations also needs to be isolated in a sterile, gentle, and GMP-compliant environment. So all these factors together actually really limit the manufacturing skill, compromise the reproducibility. At the same time, it could also drive up the manufacturing cost. So how to make these very complex cell manufacturing processes more standardized, more scalable, and also more affordable for the end users? So here are some solutions from Mutiny Biotech. Yeah. First, with the CleanMac Prodigy platform, so these separated open handling steps, multiple devices, skilled operators, and high-class clean rooms can be integrated into one automated and closed system. And the users can also build customized PSC expansion and the differentiation processes on the CleanMac Prodigy. And then with the MaxQuant analyzer, these, uh, the standardized IPC QC assays can also be realized by automated flow cytometry analysis. Finally, the MaxQuant title cell sorter can be applied to isolate the desired cell populations with a very gentle, fast, and GMP-compliant cell sorting technology. So today, actually, we will focus on the CleanMac Prodigy. Well, together with the disposable tubing sets, the CleanMac Prodigy allows automated cell processing from starting materials to final products. And uh, upon your request, it can automate all these different cell handling steps, including sample preparation, density gradient centrifugation, cell washing, medium change, man magnetic cell separation, cell stimulation, genetic modification, until the final product formulation. And uh, Based on the CleanMac Prodigy platform, we have developed a broad range of software applications for various cell types and workflows, for example, for the CAR-T cells. Well, for the adherent cell types, such as prepotent stem cells and their derivatives, we have developed the adherent cell culture process. Then using this CleanMac Prodigy adherent cell culture process, cell cultivation can take place in two different units. The centricode unit 
and the external culture vessels. So first, there's a Climac Prodigy chamber lies inside the central code unit. It supports automated adherent and non-adherent cell cultures. The central code unit also supports controls of temperature, the air and CO2 concentrations. There is an integrated microscope under the chamber for visual examinations. And there are also multiple input ports for using different media and the cytokines. So the central code unit offers 100 square centimeter surface space. Well, if larger surface space is required, then uh, external culture vessels, such as these um, multi-layer cell stacks, can also be easily connected to the tubing set 730 via stereo welding. And the users can connect maximally three of these five layer cell stacks at the same time. And that will offer roughly 10,000 square centimeter surface space. So already fairly large. And now uh, let's have a look of this adherent cell culture software. So when we designed it, our goal is really to make sure it is flexible enough to culture different cell types. So that's why we modularized the individual cell hunting steps. And now uh, you can find these different modules on the main menu uh, of the adherent cell culture process yeah, for density gradient centrifugation, for coating, inoculation, cell culture, medium change, harvest, etc. And the users can freely select and combine these different modules in different orders. And as a result, very complex workflows, such as expansion and the differentiation of human PSCs, can be realized on this Climac Prodigy adherence of culture process. And within each module, the users can also set up the cell culture parameters according to their established SOPs. Yet for example, in a coating module, the users can set up the coating temperature, the coating time, the volume of the coating reagents according to their established SOPs. Well, we have already established several workflows on the Climac Prodigy adherence of culture process. This includes the GMP compliant expansion of human MSCs and PSCs, as well as directed differentiation of human PSCs into mid-brain dopaminergic progenitor cells and cardiomyocytes. cells. And now I will just very quickly show you some performance data on the PSC expansion and MDA progenitor cell differentiation workflows. Well, for the PSC expansion workflow, we have first developed the IPS brew GMP medium, which is manufactured and tested under the quality management system ISO 13485, and it is designed following the recommendations of USP 1043 on ethanary materials. It is currently available in bottles, but soon we will also offer this medium in bag format. And in our experiments, the results show that this medium enables very stable and efficient human PSC expansion as either clusters or single cells. And it also, it also supports very fast culture reinitiation after the cryopreservation. And it is based on the same formulation as our research grade Stemex IPSC brew uh, Sino frame medium, thus can support seamless transitions you know, from research grade to GMP compliant processes. Then, by applying this IPS brew GMP medium on the closed and automated climacrology adherence cell culture process, the users now can choose and combine these different modules to automate all these uh, complex handling steps. For example, coating of the culture vessels, PSC inoculation, medium change, PSC harvest, etc. And we have performed side-by-side -side comparisons between manual and the Climac Prodigy-based PSC expansion using our flow cytometry IPCQC technologies. Well, looking at the expression levels of the propotency markers and the trilineage differentiation potentials, the Climac Prodigy and the manual control are very comparable. Then by using the centrical unit or different sizes of the external culture vessels, the users can also easily 
reach different PSC expansion skills with much less open handling steps. Uh, we know that establishing GMP compliant PSC banks is a major step in many clinical applications. So for this purpose, the closed and automated ClinMac Prodigy adherence cell culture process together with our IPS rule GMP medium and our flow cytometry IPC QC technologies, they could be very valuable assets. So here, just an example. Recently, uh, Dr. Raphael Crow from the Sarah Foundation in Japan has successfully transferred their manual GMP-compliant human IPSC expansion workflow into the ClinMac Prodigy adherence cell culture process. Well, he has presented his work at the ISCR 2021 Tokyo Symposium and at several joint webinars with us. And his webinar presentation is available on our website, so please feel free to have a look if you're interested. Not only just for PSC expansion, the ClinMac Prodigy adherence cell culture process can also automate complex PSC differentiation workflows, such as main brain dopaminergic progenitor cell differentiation. And this, this application has been supported by a prestigious uh, EU consortium, the Neural Stem Cell Repair Consortium. And we have collaborated with the key opinion leaders in this field. The challenge for us was, you know, if we could precisely adapt their original manual proto protocol into this automated and closed ClinMac Prodigy adherence cell culture process. And we have successfully fulfilled this task and established a workflow on the ClinMac Prodigy for MDA progenitor cell differentiation. Well, all the technical de details are, and the performance data can be found in this dedicated application sheet. So I will skip the, the process details here. Instead, I want to show you the side-by-side -side comparison results between menu and the ClinMac Prodigy-based uh, process. Again, using our MaxQuant analyzer, so the flow cytometry analysis showed that uh, the cells differentiated on the ClinMac Prodigy are very comparable to the cells differentiated manually at the lab scale, with more than 80% of the resulting cells co-expressing the key MDA progenitor cell markers, FOXA2 and OTX2. Nearly no expression of the negative markers, PEC6, SOX1, or the prepotency markers, OCT4, and also decreased expression of the, uh, of the uh, proliferation marker, KI67. Well, this shows that the ClinMac Prodigy adherence cell culture process can also support very efficient human PSC differentiation workflows. Here is just another example. So in October last year, we had a joint webinar with Dr. Daru Sarin, the executive director from the Cedar Sinai Bell Manufacturing Center in the US. Well, he has presented their human IPSC expansion and the differentiation workflows, and they find that the closed an automated ClinMac Prodigy adherence cell culture process has some unique advantages. His webinar presentation is also available on our website, so please feel free to have a look if you're interested in uh, learning more details. So actually, uh, this is already everything from my site today, and uh, this is the disclaimer of my presentation. Uh, Thanks a lot for your attention. I'm lo looking forward to discussing with you in the Q&A session. And now I would like to hand over to Professor Crystal Monville to introduce their exciting projects using human propotent stem cells. Well, thank you, Chao, for uh, this uh, kind invitation to participate to this webinar. I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, to be here. And thanks, Leslie, uh, for uh, all the organization. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, present uh, the work we've been doing the last 10 years on uh, developing uh, a clinical application from, for some uh, regional uh, diseases. And um, uh, just to uh, give you some uh, background, uh, so on the retina is composed of several layers of cells. Uh, you have at the very back of the retina the photoreceptors, cone and nodes, that are uh, responsible for the light conversion into electrical signals that are then processes to, uh, to the brain. And then at the very back of the, 
of the retina, you have a layer of epithelial cells uh, that are uh, very important for uh, different functions uh, of photoreceptors because they are doing lots of uh, different uh, uh, functions like uh, light absorption, uh, epithelial transport, uh, visual cycle recycle, phagocytosis of the outer segments of the photoreceptors. I generally call them the, the babysitters of the photoreceptors. And uh, uh, in, in different diseases, when uh, you have dysfunction, uh, of those uh, uh, epithelial layers, and it occurs in, in about 5% of some uh, genetic diseases like retinitis pigmentosa, then you will have uh, the loss of the photoreceptors. And those cells are also uh, dysfunctioning and degenerating in a, a very common and very frequent uh, disease, which is the age-related macular degeneration. So the, the, the idea of this, this program was actually to, uh, to generate some uh, uh, epithelial cells, some retinal pigmented epithelial cells, the, the RP cells, uh, from uh, pluripotent stem cells, and, and more precisely from human embryonic stem cells, and then to dispose those RP cells onto a, a, a membrane. Here we choose the denuded human amniotic membrane to actually reproduce the organization of this epithelium that uh, uh, we have in the retina, and then graft this little patch uh, under the, the, the retina in the subretinal space of the retina and uh, uh, in order to slow down actually uh, the, the disease uh, and the degeneration of photoreceptors. And it's, it's a very collaborative work as we collaborate on this program with the Institut de la Vision and the uh, Kinsman Hospital in Paris, but also uh, with the uh, Saint Louis Hospital in Paris, the uh, Biotherapies Institute, the IFM Thelaton Institute, and the Roslin Cell Laboratory in Edinburgh that provided us with the uh, human uh, embryonic uh, stem cell clinical grade. And really the idea is really to delay this uh, photoreceptor death by grafting this patch uh, before uh, the, 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 the disease is too advanced. So how do we do that? And uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, some uh, insight into the manufacturing process. So from the human embryonic stem cells, we generated a bank and then we differentiate the uh, uh, actually the, the human embryonic stem cells into uh, RPE and you could see the, the RP are, are well organized, they look like cobblestone uh, pigmented cells and the, the bank was actually generated in a GMP facility in France, in Nantes, in 2017. And then uh, to make the patch, we also uh, saw the amniotic membrane and uh, we put together uh, the cells and the amniotic membrane by using this uh, uh, filter insert uh, that resembled to a, a clear tambourine. So you put the amniotic membrane in between the, the two uh, pieces and then you could uh, load your cells and the cells will actually um, make their, their tight junction uh, over four weeks of culture, and you could uh, see on the on the left uh, that the cells are very well organized. They form a monolayer on on the top of the amniotic membrane, and we could also uh, verify that the, those cells are uh, functional uh, by measuring the phagocytosis of uh, outer segments. And uh, the, the final step is actually to invade this uh, product into gelatin to be able to um, man manipulate uh, the patch uh, before transplantation. And I will show you a little uh, video on that. So um, we've got lots of quality controls to ensure the uh, quality of the, 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 the little patch. So the patch is a five by three millimeters uh, and we put about 120 uh, thousand cells on the top of this patch. And of course we check for identity, purity, safety, uh, impurity, patency and integrity of the product. And uh, uh, we, um, we um, have done all the proof of concept in different uh, models uh, uh, like uh, rats and non-human primates. And, and the, the, the video is not um, working here, but you can see that the patch is actually uh, embedded in gelatin. And the gelatin will actually give some elasticity 
and to uh, the patch to be able to uh, to roll on uh, in the in the injection system and we use the injection system that is normally used for cataract surgery and then when we push the uh, the patch uh, in the subretinal space the patch will allowed uh, and 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 will be uh, flat under the retina and here we we had to develop uh, specific devices to actually uh, generate the product and and we we uh, developed <clears throat> this um, this plastic device where you have a, a stream mold where you could put the uh, culture insert and then we with different caps actually we could insert the gelatin uh, and then we put everything at four degrees for the gelatin to polymerize. And then we have a second cap for transportation with the, with the, with the medium. And uh, we have a third cap for cutting actually the patch at the right dimension. And as you can see on the slide, the patch has a SIM card format uh, to allow actually uh, the, the, the good, the right orientation under the retina. And uh, we have done all the, studies also in a non-human primate in order to check all the steps for uh, preparation in the GMP manufacturing uh, facility, but also the transportation and, and, and then the graft uh, in, uh, in an eye that is actually the same size than the human eye. Uh, and also to check all the surgery uh, procedure. And you could see on this image that the patch is correctly um, uh, implanted under the retina. And we are uh, going for the macula, which is the central uh, uh, part of the of the of the of the retina uh, in in uh, in uh, involved in the in the central vision daylight vision. And the patch is very stable. It doesn't. Uh, move uh, under the time, and, and also the cells are connected uh, with the endogenous photoreceptors. So we, we've done all the preclinical uh, work, uh, proof of concept work, uh, and it took us about 10 years actually to perform all these uh, steps. And uh, in 2019, we had the uh, approval for the clinical trial for uh, patients who have a certain form of retinitis pigmentosa, so genetic disease, with a mutation like ERIT and MRTK. And uh, this uh, clinical trial is a phase one, two uh, clinical trial. So it will look at safety uh, and to tolerability of the patch. But we also want to uh, look at some preliminary efficacy uh, studies. And uh, we've got two cohorts in this uh, uh, clinical trial. The clinical trial is performed at, in Paris at the Cancer Hospital, and the Dr. Stéphane Bertin is the surgeon. And actually, uh, we uh, have a first cohort with two patients that has a very low uh, visual acuity, so very advanced, uh, that are legally blind. And, and uh, we are looking for uh, evaluation of the um, page, patch placement and position and uh, uh, good uh, safety measures. And for the second cohort, we have uh, um, plan two, 10 patients, sorry, with a little better visual equity uh, in the worst type and with uh, still photoreceptors that are present in order to uh, look at the um, delayed or stop of photoreceptor deaths. Um, and uh, we started in, in 2019. So this is the first year of follow-up with lots of uh, uh, different uh, uh, examination visits. But it's just to uh, show you that the patients are under immunosuppression for almost a year. And those patients will be followed for another four years uh, after uh, this uh, first uh, year of, of, uh, of treatment. And uh, so far, we have actually implanted seven patients. Uh, we've been a little bit delayed uh, with the pandemic, but we have uh, uh, transplanted seven patients. Uh, and uh, just to show you uh, some results on this uh, uh, clinical trial, so uh, you could see in the top uh, right the patch that has been colored actually in blue uh, in order for the surgeon to, to see the patch. And uh, the patch is implanted uh, under the retina uh, through a pass uh, uh, vitrectomy. And you could see uh, on the right, in the bottom right, you could see the patch that was implanted correctly 
under the retina and you could see some pigmentation uh, showing that the cells are uh, present uh, on this patch. And uh, uh, now this patient has uh, uh, three years, has been implanted since three years, and you could see the pigmentation that has increased, but the patch is still in place, uh, showing no movement, no problem in, in inflammation or safety or, or anything. And on this uh, actually uh, image, you could see that the patch is well in place. You've got images two months after uh, implantation and then three years after implantation, and the patch is still in the same place. It hasn't uh, moved. It hasn't changed in sickness and everything is, is going right. Uh, we also followed very closely um, um, uh, rejection, eventual rejection by following anti-HLA antibodies. And, and just to, to have a, a, a brief a message, uh, everything is going well. And we've got lots of data actually following uh, different uh, episodes like COVID infection, we are looking when we stop the uh, uh, immunosuppression treatment and also COVID vaccination uh, and actually uh, everything is, is going uh, fine in, in those patients. Uh, and um, we even, and it was, it was not really uh, uh, something that we were expecting, but uh, in those patients, in the first patient, but in all, all the patients, we also uh, find a little improvement in the fetation so it's very encouraging, uh, and we are now following uh, the other patients and looking very uh, carefully into uh, into the data. So just as a, an intermediate conclusion, uh, we've shown, I think, that we've got a good uh, safety tolerance of the patch. Uh, we, we didn't see any problem in, in cell proliferation, which is something that is um, um, often uh, a, a risk, a major risk for uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells, but we, we didn't see any problems. And we might also have some uh, preliminary results that uh, is show, are showing that we might have a functional uh, little improvement for uh, some patients. And and just to to, uh, to go into the manufacturing, uh, go back to the manufacturing, we know that for uh, cost-efficient uh, cell therapy, we need to, uh, of course, uh, uh, go for late uh, scale production, and uh, we have actually adapted uh, the differentiation protocol onto an automate, which is the Compact Select, and this has been published uh, many years ago now, and, and we've got a pattern on that, showing that actually we could produce RPE cells in a very good quality uh, in, in a, uh, an automated uh, fashion. And we're also working on a cryopreservation of the tissue. But just to, to go back on this uh, uh, scale of production, uh, we, we have uh, developed this uh, uh, process where we could uh, really increase the production uh, in the number of uh, RP-derived uh, cells from human um, uh, embryonic stem cells. But we've also done that with uh, IPS, so uh, from different types of human proliferative stem cells and the RP are uh, the same quality. We've checked all the quality control. The only problem with this uh, compact uh, select uh, automate is that it's not really suitable uh, for GMP production because it's a, a, an open um, uh, automate and we need a, a fully uh, closed actually system. So we're now transferring uh, this uh, process onto the uh, Clinimax Prodigy with the, with the help uh, in collaboration uh, in ISTEM with the Dr. Uh, Olivier uh, Chose. Uh, and uh, we have uh, performed some very preliminary study in, in some cell stack because, uh, as you have understood, RP cells are adherent cells. And so we need to uh, do the process in, uh, in an adherent manner. So we're using the Corning cell stack. And actually, we've tried uh, using the uh, cell stack one layer and two layers. And you could see on the image, uh, in, the, in the bottom of my slide that actually we have been able to uh, obtain uh, very nice uh, RP cells uh, on this uh, cell stack. So we're now 
uh, moving on this uh, GMP uh, uh, Clinimax Prodigy uh, to uh, produce our RP cells, and uh, uh, we hope to actually uh, try the uh, the five layers very soon and and actually uh, uh, do the whole process on the on the Prodigy. So. Um, the next challenges for the cell therapy program are, okay, scale up and cryopreserve. Uh, we're also working on um, escaping or, or decreasing uh, eventually uh, immune reaction. Uh, we're also uh, actually working on trying to, to modify the environment, the retinal environment, uh, to uh, for the cells to be better integrated, better survival. But we're also working on generating a more complex tissue by adding photoreceptors, uh, because the, the the product that I have uh, that I have presented are just covering. Um, a, a few percent of uh, uh, people with uh, some uh, retinal diseases. And of course, we would like to uh, be able to cover uh, all the retinitis pigmentosa so patients, but also more advanced uh, AMD uh, patients. And uh, we have, uh, again, some preliminary results, very encouraging, showing that we could uh, produce uh, photoreceptors. So uh, by that, I, uh, I am handing my presentation uh, with some acknowledgement for, of course, all the people that has been participating to this work. And you could see there's a lot of people uh, involved in this program uh, that help us uh, on developing all the steps needed to, to go for clinical trial. Uh, I would like also to um, uh, thanks the, the, the funding that we had and also uh, the patients uh, that participated to this uh, uh, great uh, adventure uh, of the clinical trial. And this ends my presentation and I'm thanking you for uh, your uh, listening and I will be happy to answer any question that you could have. Thank you very much.